Hello, my name is Laura Fayad. I'm the Chief of Musculoskeletal Imaging at Johns Hopkins University. And in the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be discussing Paget's disease of bone, the imaging and clinical features. Here's a picture of Sir James Paget. He's the one that described the disease entity that we now know as Paget's disease originally as osteitis deformans in 1877 to describe the multiple deformities that he had observed with this entity. It's important as radiologists to realize that after osteoporosis, Paget's disease is in fact the second most common disorder to affect the elderly in the United States. So it would behoove you to learn a lot about Paget's disease. Paget's disease is a chronic metabolic disorder that is slowly progressive. It's characterized by abnormal and excessive osseous remodeling that we see here in the mosaic pattern that results in this histological slide that uh, is related to the increased bone turnover. As I said, Paget's disease is a very common entity. So 4% of people over the age of 40 are afflicted with this disorder and 11% over the age of 80. Although uh, we have observed that the disease prevalence is declining for uh, unclear reasons. Males are slightly more commonly affected than females, and certain regions of the world are more commonly affected by Paget's disease. So in the United Kingdom, for example, there's a much higher percentage of the population affected uh, than in Australia, Western Europe, and the United States, and it, the disease is rare in Scandinavia, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. The etiology of Paget's disease to this day is unclear. It is thought that it could be related to a slow viral infection because the giant osteoclasts that you see here with osteoclast overactivity are a feature of Paget's disease, but they're also a feature of viral disease. Other etiologies have been proposed, which include vascular, genetic, immunologic, metabolic, and even neoplastic um, etiology. The clinical presentation is variable and ranges from completely asymptomatic to a patient presenting with localized pain and tenderness. They can have big bones and bowing deformities uh, or kyphosis if Paget's disease affects the spine and decreased range of motion. So here's a patient with asymptomatic Paget's. This is something you will encounter fairly commonly. It's a radiograph of the pelvis for right hip pain. And you see that Paget's disease is affecting the left hip with cortical and trabecular uh, thickening as well as slight expansion of the bone compared to the right side. Another case affecting the whole right hemipelvis, and it's asymptomatic. And again, because this is a fairly common entity, you will encounter this on routine CT scan obtained for um, reasons other than evaluating the skeleton. And this is Paget's disease of the left hemipelvis. And we'll talk about the features a little bit later. As I said, the clinical presentation includes an asymptomatic presentation as well as um, a person presenting with enlargement of the skeleton and localized pain and tenderness as various deformities and decreased range in motion. So you, here you see a bowing deformity associated with all the bone remodeling of Paget's disease, and here a through and through fracture. And we will discuss the complications uh, a little bit later on in this talk. Severe complications can also occur. So if there is involvement of the skull base, then there can be basal or invagination. There can be uh, neuromuscular complications related to, say, pathologic fractures in the spine and cord compression. And if the chest rib cage is uh, involved, then cardiovascular com complications can also ensue. So, as I said uh, yet again, as I'm going to say yet again, Paget's disease is fairly common, and you will encounter it as a radiologist um, and probably be the first one to suggest the diagnosis. And if you see it on the radiograph, then you can suggest serum alkaline phosphatase as a lab study that correlates with disease activity in Paget's disease. There are other laboratory studies that are used less frequently um, that include urinary measures and serum osteocalcin, but these are less reliable for measuring disease activity. Of note, the serum calcium is usually normal, 
unless there's been a fracture or because of the uh, increased bone turnover, secondary hyperparathyroidism develops and uh, changes the calcium level. This is more commonly a polyostotic than monoostotic disease. Although in 10 to 35% of patients, the disease starts in, as a monoostotic form. It typically affects the axial skeleton more than the appendicular skeleton. So here is a distribution, the common uh, sites of affliction, and you see the lumbar spine, the sacrum, and the pelvis are most commonly afflicted. Also the skull and the femur. Less frequent sites in, uh, include the proximal humerus and scapula, the cervical and thoracic spine, and even the hands and feet. So let's talk about imaging uh, of Paget's disease. Well, there are, you will encounter Paget's disease on, on all the modalities. Radiography is our mainstay primary modality uh, on which you'll probably see it frequently. And you should be familiar with the classic triad of Paget's disease. One, there's a thickened cortex. Two, there's accentuation of the trabecular pattern. And three, you can see there's a relative increase in bone size compared to normal bones. Now, depending on the phase of Paget's disease, we may not uh, realize all uh, the components of this triad, and we'll talk about the phases now. So the natural history includes three phases. First, the lytic phase, or the incipient active phase, in which osteoclastic resorption predominates, and hence you have lysis. There is a mixed phase, or the active phase, where osteoclastic as well as osteoblastic activity occurs. And then the blastic phase, which is later uh, and proceeding to inactive disease, in which osteoblastic activity declines. So depending on the phase in which you encounter Paget's, the appearance will be different. So here we have the long bones, um, a frontal view of the tibia, a sagittal, and another patient with a lytic phase of Paget's disease. And the characteristic here is that it's ill-defined, it's diaphyseal or sometimes metaphyseal, and it has a um, characteristic margin of being flame-shaped or a blade of grass appearance. So as the lytic phase progresses over time, uh, it enlarges and spreads toward the end of bone, and it spreads about one centimeter per year. So here again, you see lytic phase of Paget's, and the margin is characterized as a flame shape or blade of grass appearance. It occurs in the metaphysis or diaphysis first, and then extends to the end of bone. Here we have the mixed phase and following, followed by the blastic phase. So you see this person over time uh, develop pagets all the way to the end of bone and the articular surface of the tibia. And then the blastic phase where there's more sclerosis and, and uh, greater involvement. In the skull, you, in the lytic phase is characterized as osteoporosis circumscripta. It's a large lucent area that you'll see on the radiograph, usually found in the frontal or occipital region. As time goes on, here's uh, osteoporosis circumscripta of the skull. The uh, mixed and blastic phases take over, and you can uh, have a cotton wool appearance uh, in the skull, as we see here. And the, if the skull base is involved, basilar invagination can occur. Here's a pathologic specimen, and you see the skull involvement with this markedly thickened um, skull. In the pelvis, the features are also characteristic. There's rarefaction in the central ilium, uh, is what we typically see. And through the mixed and um, blastic phases, we'll see, th again, thickening of the trabecular pattern, thickening of the iliopectineal line, and enlargement of the hemipelvis uh, compared to the right side. So these are typical features of Paget's in the pelvis. Another feature that can be observed is due to the excessive re bone remodeling, you can have protrusio acetabulum, which um, you see here compared to the left side. And in the spine, again, we have the same features of Paget's with cortical thickening, trabecular pattern, 
uh, coarsening and expansion of the bone compared with the adjacent vertebra. So this has been described as a picture frame appearance that you see here on the pathologic specimen. And over time, the whole vertebra can be white, otherwise known as an ivory vertebra. And we'll discuss the differential diagnosis of an ivory vertebra a little bit later. But this is characteristic of Paget's. Some of the less common sites that you might encounter, for example, on a routine chest radiograph, you see the mid-diaphysis to the end of bone of the clavicle on the left is involved by Paget's. Again, the cortical thickening evident here and enlargement relative to the right side. Other less common entity uh, locations, the calcaneus and the patella. And you see, again, the whole bone is involved with uh, coarse intrabecular cortical thickening and expansion. So let's talk about the complications of Paget's disease. Number one, uh, there's weakened bone that causes uh, fractures, other, known as the banana fracture, shown here as a uh, fracture of the proximal femur. There are bowing deformities, as we said before, due to the bone turnover and remodeling, and uh, these can cause stresses along the convex margin of the long bone and result in a stress fracture that we see here, this horizontal lucency with surrounding sclerosis, a little bit more extensive non-displaced fracture, and a little bit more displaced fracture and a very displaced fracture. So some of the complications of uh, pathogens with respect to fracture can be fairly severe. If the fracture occurs in the spine, these are compression, pathologic fractures of the uh, spine. There can be cord compression and nerve root impingement, so neurologic complications uh, occurring. And if the skull base is involved, there can be basilar invagination, so something to watch out for in Paget's disease. Arthritis is a common um, associated complication as well. So here you have the whole right hemipelvis is involved and arthro arthritic changes at the sacroiliac joint, the symphysis pubis, and you see the osteophytes and protrusio of the right hip joint. And in the spine, you get degenerative disc disease associated with this picture frame vertebra of Paget's disease. So there's narrowing of the disc space and osteophyte formation. Now, neoplasms have been described with Paget's disease, and it should be something you're on the lookout for. Uh, it's a dreaded complication, but giant cell tumor, uh, interestingly, has been observed in Paget's disease, typically in the skull and face, although... Uh, in this patient, we see it in the pelvis. And then uh, sarcomas have been also been described with Paget's disease. They typically occur on the pelvis and extremities. And sarcomas such as osteosarcoma, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, or fibrosarcoma, and chondrosarcoma have been described. It's unclear whether lymphoma or myeloma are associated with Paget's, but they have been described um, in Paget's disease as well. Here you have a radiograph, and there uh, is evidence of Paget's, or in the past there was more clear evidence of Paget's in the right hemipelvis. On this radiograph, you see there is complete lysis of the pubic ramus superiorly, a large soft tissue mass around the pelvis, and then ossific mineralization uh, within the soft tissue component. So this is degeneration into osteosarcoma. And upon observing this radiograph, you should request cross-sectional imaging to further characterize the extent of disease. So we've talked a lot about radiography. Uh, you will also encounter Paget's disease on other modalities. So on CT imaging, um, CT is really a extension of radiography, and so the features we see by radiograph are also observed by CT, and these include cortical and trabecular thickening and expansion of the bone. But in addition, by cross-sectional imaging, we can see the fat-filled marrow spaces that are characteristic of this disorder. When you see a loosened area within the Paget's um, bone, pagetic bone, you should always check for Hounsfield units and make sure this is uh, fatty marrow and not uh, soft tissue density that might be characteristic of malignant degeneration. So you see here, this is fatty marrow similar to subcutaneous fat.
And another patient with Paget's disease, you see the cortical uh, trabecular thickening and the interspersed fatty marrow elements. Here's a patient, again, large fatty spaces as well as a pathologic fracture through the area of Paget's. And on MRI, similarly, we have the features of expansion, cortical thickening, trabecular coarsening, but the the important feature to recognize that the, there's uh, is fatty marrow spaces that are uh, present within the pagetic bone, and that helps you with the differential diagnosis. So here you have a distal femur that's involved. Again, it's an enlarged femur compared to the right. There's cortical thickening, trabecular coarsening, and uh, you see all the fatty marrow spaces uh, on the T1-weighted image. By STIR imaging, you can see hyperintensity, um, perhaps until the, the very inactive blastic phase where the signal intensity can be closer to normal. And one thing to know is that uh, this is a very hypervascular disease. And if you do dynamic contrast enhanced imaging or just a static post-contrast uh, study, you will see a lot of vascularity within the area of Paget's disease. And that should not dissuade you from the diagnosis or make you nervous or make you wonder if there's malignant degeneration because this is a an expected feature of the disorder. So hypervascularity is a characteristic of Paget's disease. So let's talk about somewhat atypical appearances and the differential diagnosis of Paget's. Here you have a patient, two views of the forearm, and you see that we have an abnormality extending all the way to the end of bone, which is something we do see with Paget's. We do see that there's cortical thickening, although there is also exuberant periosteal reaction, perhaps some spicules, a lot of bone remodeling. We do see expansion, and we do see trabecular um, coarsening, perhaps at the distal margin here at the end of bone. So in reading this radiograph, uh, you might be concerned that this is something other than just Paget's disease, even if you thought to yourself that there probably is some underlying Paget's. You might be concerned that there's a bone-forming tumor in the central portion of this lesion. So it would be um, perfectly uh, acceptable to order cross-sectional imaging. But it is also good to know that there are pseudo-malignant lesions in Paget's disease that have been described. Because of the excessive bone remodeling, you can really have uh, exuberant periosteal reaction. However, cross-sectional imaging is always a good idea to make sure there's no associated malignancy. Now, in the lytic phase of Paget's disease, I think this is the most challenging phase to diagnose. Um, something you need to keep in the back of your mind when looking at radiography. Here you have distal radius. There's a lytic area with an ill-defined margin. And you might think about um, the differential diagnosis for lytic lesions. Uh, in this location, since it's toward the end of bone, you could think about giant cell tumor, for example, or even malignancy. But the thing I want to um, remind you of is that there is this flame shape or blade of grass appearance that's associated with Paget's. And upon reading this radiograph, something you could do is suggest an al serum alkaline phosphatase um, and uh, follow this patient uh, over time to see how the phases develop. So something to be aware of in the morphology. This is, I show this as a somewhat atypical appearance in that the location is a little bit atypical um, toward the wrist, since Paget's disease is more common in the spine and lumbar spine and pelvis. Here we have an enlarged vertebra that's uh, ivory, an ivory vertebra. And as we said, this is has been described with Paget's disease. What else could this be? Well, the differential diagnosis you should keep in mind is lymphoma, metastatic disease, and Paget's disease. So you will look, search for evidence of Paget's disease elsewhere in the skeleton, and of course, evidence of lymphoma or metastatic disease elsewhere as well. So let's just talk about the differential diagnosis of Paget's or metastatic disease. Um, Onco oncologic patients also uh, present with Paget's disease. Uh, 
and uh, they often get PET scans. Uh, and lucky for us that Paget's disease is typically negative on PET, while uh, metastatic disease, depending on the histology, of course, is typically positive. So this is a medullary MET. We don't see it as well on CT because MRI is more sensitive to medullary disease. And this is a negative um, pegetic bone on the, on the other side. What about this case? Is this metastatic disease or could this be Paget's? Well, what we can observe is that although there appears to be some coarse interbecula, perhaps, um, much of the spaces are not fat fl filled, but a little bit more dense. And certainly there are discrete areas of uh, sclerotic foci. This is a lytic lesion that was not fat density, but uh, soft tissue density. And the and the involvement is very diffuse, the entire visualized skeleton. So he, we also have absence of um, the, the triad of uh, Paget's disease that we expect, which includes the cortical thickening, uh, in addition to trabecular thickening and expansion. It's also very diffuse, and uh, while Paget's disease is monoostotic, it's not uh, so uniformly diffuse like this. So this is metastatic prostate cancer. So in summary, uh, we discussed the fact that Paget's disease is a chronic, slowly progressive metabolic bone disorder. Its clinical presentation ranges from asymptomatic to having severe complications. And the imaging presentation is really related to what phase uh, the Paget's disease is in, the lytic phase probably being most challenging of the three. And remember that it's fairly common, and so you will encounter Paget's disease on multiple modalities. Thank you very much.